And then we've grown to be one of the largest uh, real estate investing residential companies in the state of New Jersey doing over, you know, 175 plus flips and wholesales a, deal, a year. Um, and then as we sat back and started looking at what our life had become, we realized that we did a great job building ourselves a high paying, highly taxed job. And even though we had a great team, we were doing well, we were expanding, we were making money. Um, it wasn't the lifestyle that I wanted. We got into to real estate, I think, um, for financial freedom, right? And I, I, I think a lot of us do ourselves a disservice by getting into real estate and not really having the plan to create that freedom, that passivity. And um, so we transitioned full time in the last two years into commercial real estate investing. So we focus now on large multifamily assets, self storage complexes, and student housing complexes. Welcome to the Wealth Through Real Estate Investing Podcast, your source for real world strategies focused on creating long term wealth, cash flow, and financial freedom through real estate. Through guidance, tips, and stories of highly successful real estate investors and thought leaders, we provide you the tools to succeed and reach the lifestyle you always wanted. And now your host, Dwayne Clark. Hello and welcome to the Wealth Through Real Estate Investing Podcast. This is your host, Dwayne Clark. And today we have Stephen Libman. Stephen is the Managing Director and Co-Founder of Integrity Holdings Group. Integrity is a real estate investment firm that acquires value-add properties with a specific focus on multifamily and self-storage, currently having over 2,200 units under management with a portfolio valued over $70 million. Stephen, thank you so much for joining us on the show, and how are you? I'm doing well, man. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, I really appreciate it. We talked a little bit at pre-show about the kids and, and life and, and you know just real estate in general, so it was really cool to kind of get you on and kind of pick your brain a bit and kind of, you know, give some listeners some uh, added value. Yeah, for um, sure. But before we start kicking things off, would you mind kind of sharing for the, the guest um, a little bit about your background, how you got started in real estate? Yeah. So I uh, graduated from Boston University in 2004 and I did a couple different jobs. I worked in New York City as doing sales and commuting from the Jersey Shore into New York. And it, uh, it was a lot of time on a bus and didn't love it. So got out of the city and started doing real estate as a agent first, actually. Then as a residential real estate broker, uh, managing a small team for a family member. And uh, it was there that I started working with real estate investors. I started targeting uh, deals for other real estate investors and finding them deal flow. And it was uh, a good learning curve. You know, I got to sit by these guys and kind of see what it looked like to do a fix and flip. And I used to see the front end of it and the back end of it. And so I figured I could do it myself. And uh, we did. So we, we jumped in, we started a wholesale business so that we could raise some capital and then start some, um, some fix and flips. And, you know, that was back in 2011, 2010 where we started our own company, Integrity Holdings was founded. And then we've grown to be one of the largest uh, real estate investing residential companies in the state of New Jersey doing over, you know, 175 plus flips and wholesales a, deal, a year. Um, and then as we sat back and started looking at what our life had become, we realized that we did a great job building ourselves a high paying, highly taxed job. And even though we had a great team, we were doing well, we were expanding, we were making money. Um, it wasn't the lifestyle that I wanted. We got into to real estate, I think, um, for financial freedom, right? And I, I, I think a lot of us do ourselves a disservice by getting into real estate and not really having the plan to create that freedom, that passivity. And um, so we transitioned full time in the last two years into commercial real estate investing. So we focus now on large multifamily assets, self storage complexes and student housing complexes. This year we have two LOIs out. So we might get that number up to about 88 million by the end of the year. Nice. Yeah. Cause yeah, you know, me and you have some similar backgrounds. I, you know, started in kind of fix and flip wholesaling business and, you know, wanted to kind of scale up to do different 
uh, different things. But the, the main key thing was the same thing that you were saying about, you know, you're making all this money and it's this taxable income and you got to kind of trans over, transition over to the passive side. So that's, that's very cool. Um, can you kind of tell us about like that initial transition from wholesaling, you know, more on the active side to more of this commercial side? Like how did that first deal look like? Um, did you just go through, go um, directly to it yourselves or did you you know partner with anybody like can you tell us the experience sure yeah i think a lot of people that i know make that transition similarly and it's uh it's with a partner because it's very difficult to break into the commercial space if you don't have a track record so we were beating on you know real estate agents nationwide we were calling these guys and saying hey i flip a lot of houses and now i want to do this and they were all really nice, but they didn't, they weren't sending us off market deals, right? They weren't sending us pocket listings. They, they didn't care that we were going to flip $40 million worth of property. They wanted to know if we could execute on a $15 million building. And there's qualifiers to be able to execute, right? You need the personal financial statements to be a, a key principal in these deals. You need to be able to get the loan, even though they're not in recourse, you need to have personal financial statements that back up um, the ability to pay that loan. So there's a couple of hurdles that single family guys like ourselves have getting into the multifamily space. Um, so we just did what we did in the residential space and we went and found guys that were smarter than us and doing it better than us. Went to a couple of seminars, went and met with a couple of sponsors that were buying and selling deals. And we just said, Hey, if you had to do it all over again, how would you get involved? And, uh, one of our mentors, Corey, you'll hear us talk about him a lot. He, uh, he told us, Hey, the money's not in the, the money or the money's not in the deal. The money's in the money. You guys from the single family space have a specific set of skills. Liam Neeson, right? You have a specific set of skills to be able to raise capital into somebody else's deal. So you partner with a experienced sponsor that has a hundred to $150 million under management or better. And basically you raise and deploy capital with them and say that you'll manage, you know, um, the investor pool and you'll manage the capital raise and you'll help during due diligence. And you basically become partners with these guys and you get paid to learn along the way. Mm, I, I love that a lot. That's uh, like I said, easiest way to do it. I kind of have a similar step where I have, you know, my mentor who I've been <clears throat> doing a transaction with on a broker size for years. And they just finally said, this is how I do it. You know, just kind of, go under his wing and you know you learn the business and you're able to transition in and then you'll be able to scale up where you're doing stuff um you know on your on your level kind of fast forwarding now to your business where you guys are you know doing some larger transactions you said you're focused on multifamily self-storage and uh, student housing yeah that's right okay cool so what kind of decided to do kind of like a diverse type of portfolio which is i think is very smart Sure. Um, you know, most people kind of focus on one specific niche, but you guys kind of broaden it up, which kind of like, you know, have multiple risk factors and stuff in different, you know, different industries. Yeah. So about six years ago, my dad passed away and he lost nearly half of his portfolio in the stock market. And then he didn't have the ability to ride the market back up. And that threw a flag for me in terms of, you know, yeah, and he was close to retirement age, right? So he wasn't in very high risk, high volatile mutual funds and stocks and bonds. He was in what we would consider the safer asset classes in Wall Street. Still ended up losing, you know, 40 to 50% of his portfolio during that downturn. And it, it made me start questioning where should we start putting assets and where should we start collecting assets that will survive a downturn, that will do better during uh, a recession than other asset classes. So we're pretty risk averse. I mean, I think a lot of people look at entrepreneurs and think that we are risk minded, but we're pretty risk averse. We, we'll take risk with our own personal capital, but not with anybody else's. Mm -hmm. So through some study, we started looking at, you know, the real estate investment uh, trusts and what those had done over the years. So we looked at really a hundred years of data and compared the stock market data to commercial real estate and further. So we, we looked at real estate as a whole, right? And then we looked at residential versus commercial. Then we looked at commercial and dug deeper into the different asset classes. So I, you know, not all real estate is created equal. 
And during the last downturn, you'll see that some had more volatility than others. Now, still less volatile than the stock market and still less volatile than residential, but had its own um, even safer asset classes. So the three asset classes that we invest in were really the least volatile during the last downturn. So you're buying properties on cash flow. You're not buying properties on comps. So it gives you the opportunity to really protect yourself and hedge against the risk. And I mean, hedge against inflation, hedge against Wall Street volatility, all of those things. And those three asset classes fared the best during the last downturn in terms of mortgage default rates. So mortgage default rates in the residential sector was uh, about four and a half percent in 2008 and nine. Multifamily was 0.4 percent. Self-storage was 0.04 percent. Wow. So when you're looking at those metrics, you, you kind of have a good idea of where you want to put your money. And again, it gives us some diversification through asset class as well. Yeah, very smart. Yeah, I like that a lot. Kind of uh, you know, my for my next question as far as markets, uh, you know, of course, we had mentioned you're, you're on New Jersey, not the most you know investable market far as these type of asset classes. So what markets are you guys in focus on? And what are the kind of the characteristics that you look for in the good market? Yeah. So, I mean, we own three self-storage facilities in Orlando, down in Florida. We uh, just flew back from uh, Columbus, Ohio a couple of days ago. We have an LOI accepted out there and another one going out. So really the Midwest and Southeast is where we're looking. I know that's kind of broad in general, but we are not hyper-focused on a market. We're hyper-focused on metrics. So we want to know where is the population growing? Where are jobs going? What's the job diversity looking like? And is that going to be sustainable over the next 10 years? So California, New York, and New Jersey are the top three exited states in the country. That's why we choose not to even look at deal flow there. Um, Orlando is the second fastest growing city in the country for the last three years as dictated by Forbes. So that's a great market for us. Difficult to find cash flowing assets there that are not compressed with cap rates, right? You're, mm -hmm. It's hard to find cash flow in those real high end markets but we're building ground up development, self storage there. And the metrics are very different in for that asset class there. So really we're just looking for things in the path of growth where there's going to be upside, where the population is increasing year over year um, and where jobs are going. Right. I mean, so Columbus, Ohio, it's, you know, Facebook, Google, um, you know, all those companies are out there that are really growing. There's 2 million people in the MSA out there. They expect it to go to 3 million by 2020. So just really good metrics in terms of where the population is going, because that's going to be your economic driver. Absolutely. You, you had um, mentioned uh, new development. So you guys are taking on a whole bunch of different types of projects. So, cause my, I was going to ask you, are you guys more heavily looking at more deeper you know, rehab projects that, you know, some investors may not even touch or there's more kind of managerial, but you kind of answered my question, but could you kind of elaborate on some of the deals that you guys are working on? Yeah, we're agnostic in terms of like what the specific criteria is. We're geographically agnostic, except for those two drivers. Um, ground up development, you know, it's just got to make economic sense. So, and that's what we basically are working with our investors to do. We're trying to create safe, consistent, secure returns. And if we can do that in a way that creates the economic value um, where it's not too tight, where the deal's not too skinny, then we'll look real hard at it. You know, so like I wouldn't do ground up development of a class A multifamily building um, in the Northeast, right? Mm -hmm. I just, and I really wouldn't do ground up development probably of a uh, multifamily unit in general, because unless it's in an opportunity zone, right? Like there, there's a couple caveats, but to, to really get the basis that you're going to get on ground up development for a multifamily building, you just, you're going to pay more than replacement costs. You can't build a class C building. The, exactly. the only thing that really makes sense is to build a class A and that's not our criteria, right? We're not going to, be owners of class A buildings because there's not a lot of upside. Now, maybe when we've made all of our money and we just want to sit, and that's when we'll start doing some uh, class A type buildings. But no, so we're doing ground up development, but those are all storage facilities in Florida. So the metrics had to be there, to, the economic drivers had to be there to do that. Um, we own a student housing complex in Iowa, 
It was already cash flowing, a little bit of upside with the rent bumps, mismanaged. So that's really just a management play. Um, we have great managers that are going to go in there and clean that place up, and there's going to be upside with that. And then the next one that we're going under contract on is you know 276 units. It's a heavy lift, right? I mean, there's a, it's a $15, $16 million deal. It's going to be about $2.5, $3 million worth of CapEx. So that's going to be a heavy lift, but ton of value added over the next two years. So yeah, we're not afraid to do necessarily anything as long as the metrics check the boxes for us in terms of can we add enough economic value for this to be a viable five-year hold deal. Very smart. As far as kind of like your structure, I know you're used to with your wholesaling business, you have a, you had a team, you know, systems in place. So you guys are self-managing your own deals or are you just kind of on asset management side or are you just kind of overlooking third-party management companies? Yep. So we're just managing the managers. Um, we're doing large complexes. So, you know, we're not self-managing, especially since we don't live in any of the states that we invest in. Um, CubeSmart is the third largest REIT in the country. They're managing all of our self-storage facilities down in Florida. We're interviewing multiple managers out in Columbus. The student housing manager is one of the biggest in the country that's managing our student housing. So we take it all on a case by case basis. We're constantly managing the managers. We're making sure that we're holding them to a standard that we expect. Um, and they're fantastic at it. So we let the professionals do what they're really good at and manage those managers. And then we just really go out and talk to the investors and let them know what's coming down the pike. I like that a lot. As far as kind of like deal floor, is it typically through um, brokers still? I mean, that's how majority of the guys kind of getting their deal floor. You guys any have any specific ways that you're, you know, getting deals? Yeah. So uh, broker relationships always, you know, take the cake on that. But our sponsor relationships, our partner relationships, because when we started in the business and we started deploying capital into other people's deals, we chose really strong sponsors. So those guys are seeing really good deals, uh, mm -hmm. off market deal flow, and they're, they're able to contract somewhere between four and five deals each a year. So that'll give us plenty of deal flow to work on. Um, we are not concerned with a shortage of deals. I know that that tends to be a problem for a lot of independent operators, but I think it's because they probably are limiting themselves to finding the deal themselves. Um, or wholesaling. And like I said, we just, we didn't want to clear that hurdle. We couldn't clear that hurdle on our own and we tried pretty hard to do it. So once we figured out that we could overcome the deal flow problem by making the right partnerships, um, then we figured we could each solve one problem. We'll solve the money problem. They'll solve the deal problem. Very cool. Would you mind kind of sharing a little bit of the details of maybe a, you know a deal or one of your last deals as far as like how many units, structure of financing, sure. rehab budget, business plan, stuff like that? I think that'd be very interesting to hear. Sure. So I'll give you more of the tops of the waves on two deals um, just because they're so different. So you have uh, all of our storage facilities, very similar. So you have about 130,000 square feet of, of rentable space managed by CubeSmart, very simple project in terms that of, you know, it's a 14 or $12 million build. A lot of it, you know, $2 million in improvements, $10 million in um, concrete and steel. But you're hiring professional management companies, uh, professional project managers, professional general contractors that are building some of the largest uh, facilities in the area. So, they're pretty easy to manage, right? You need a, a good team in place to do that. So we have our co-sponsor that lives down there. He's managing the day to day. And when I say that, I mean, he's managing what the general contractors are doing and making sure that his reports are lining up with our expected timelines. Um, but we, it was a $12 million total project. We raised $4 million in capital. We did an $8 million construction to perm loan with a local bank that wanted to get into uh, the self storage space down there because Orlando's blowing up. And we got really favorable terms, 4.65% um, on an interest only construction basis that accrues during construction and then, or with an interest reserve. And then it'll perm out once we get to stabilization to, I think it'll be just around 4% at this point. Hmm. Um, but $12 million total cost, we estimate the value to be around 23 million once it's stabilized. So really fantastic deal. Um, and then the other portion of that is how do we pay our investors? So we pay our investor based on a preferred return. So 
every deal is a little bit different, but we, what it means is that they take the first piece of the pie after the debt service gets paid. And then we don't make anything until they make their preferred return. And that's how we've structured all of our deals. Um, because we're from the single family space, we found that people wanted to invest, not think about it and get a flat return that they can uh, rely on. So that's the structure that we came up with where we're able to s give them significantly above market returns with, um, the, with the security and consistency that they wanted. Cool. And as far as kind of like, I know that, you know, it takes time to stabilize and you guys are doing a lot of legwork and traveling and back and forth and, you know, a lot of stuff that's involved. Are you also, you know, doing like syndication fees, asset management fees to kind of, you know, maybe make it a little equal. And like I said, I think it'd be fair for, for the investors. Sure. So we do acquisition fees um, and we split that out with our co-sponsor. Um, and then on this one, there's a project management fee to build it because uh, we have to manage the general contractors. And then there is a small asset management fee that goes along with the, um, the everyday management, but it's pretty small. I'm between two and 3% on the acquisition side, one to 2% on the asset management side. And that's of the income that we have coming in. Mm -hmm. And the project management fee is, yeah, probably another 2% or so of the total project cost. So we don't fee our investors to death. Obviously, we have to do uh, a lot of work to get these deals off the ground. But yeah, we're basically just trying to pay the bills while we're managing the project. And then the upside really comes when we buy and sell these things. Exactly. <clears throat> kind of transition over, we had just kind of talked briefly about the investor side. So I know um, different investors have different appetites. You know, how do you guys find investors and stuff that are kind of, you know, make a perfect fit for your type of deals? Yeah. So, so far it's just been warm network. We're, you know, we're continually building and growing our network. We're inviting people onto our YouTube channel. We, you know, we just started a podcast um, that we're doing free from wall street. It's it's different, right? We're just repurposing some of the information that you and I are going to talk about. And we whittle it down to two or three minute clips so that it's very digestible. People can just jump on and kind of think, listen to what it is that we're doing. Um, and then they can go to our website and kind of see what the portfolio is, what the current opportunities are. And as long as we know them, they could sign up for the site. Um, so we're, we're just constantly networking, right? We have a pretty big, uh, group of, of people in our network now and it grows organically. I mean, you have people that are investing with you that are making great returns. And then a couple months later they say, Hey, you know, my, my aunt wants to talk to you. My cousin mm -hmm. wants to talk to you. Um, and it's really just managing those relationships properly. And we, we try to do that with really consistent um, updates. You know, in the beginning, it was difficult because we were trying to send out some emails, but we were onboarding a new software system that allows us to update our capital all at once. And they're getting uh, individual emails. We could upload videos. We could upload pictures. We've actually uploaded all of the engineering and architectural plans and the monthly management reports the rent rolls, they can see copies of the checks. All of that is done now via an investor portal. We thought that that would get up and running much faster than it did, but now everything is running nice and smooth and an uh, investor can log in and just like they can go to their Fidelity account and see what's going on with their money. They can see the same thing here. We have high definition cameras that they can log into and see the time-lapse video of everything that's taken place since the beginning of the project, if it's new construction. And then when we're doing new lighting or new striping of a, of a parking lot or something like that, then we'll go out, we'll take picture, we'll take video and we'll upload it to the portal and let everybody know, Hey, go log in. We put some new content in there for you to take a look. Cause I'm a big believer that people are getting into real estate. The same reason that I got into real estate. Um, because one, they're trying to avoid the volatility of the stock market. And two, they like to touch it and feel it and be a part of something, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, our investors are our partners in this deal. I, I want to update them and let them know what's going on. I want them to get excited about the next project that we have because we've taken such great care of them on these projects and really updated them as much as we can. So our investors look forward to monthly updates on all of our projects. Yeah, that, that is key. And uh, I, I, like, I like that a lot. You guys do a lot of communication, a lot of educational um, content, just updating them like how the market is and opportunities and just cause a lot of people just, there's not a lot of curated information for people to kind of say, you know, I can, you know, invest in these types of deals, but this information is so scattered. So you guys do a very good job kind of putting that information together. That's, that's awesome. Thanks man. Yeah. I appreciate that. 
So just kind of talking so people kind of get a little bit more to know about you, kind of what's a typical day for you and, you know, do you have any specific uh, morning routines? Yeah. So routine is a strong word. <laughs> I have three kids. Uh, well, I have two kids and one on the way. So my wife. Is, oh, we uh, relate a lot on this one. I know, I know what you're going to say. <laughs> <laughs> so we try to routine some stuff, but you know how it is. I mean, uh, the kids kind of run uh, the schedule a little bit more. So we, so I try to wake up early. Um, if I can get up about a half hour, 40 minutes before the rest of the family does, then I get some quiet time. Um, I'm a Christian guy, so I like to read the Bible in the morning and pray and just kind of meditate on uh, on his word and then just spend some time cooking breakfast for the girls, getting them ready for the day. Uh, I drive my daughter to school every day, which has been a real blessing. I get to spend time with her. It's about a 20-minute ride to her school, so I get to spend uh, 20 minutes in the car every day talking to her about what's going on in her life and her day, and she's six, so she's still happy to really chat it up with me and uh and then you know once i get back I like to go to the gym work out go for a bike ride do something something active and then uh, really just sit down and go through my day and figure out what kind of the critical things are that i need to accomplish that day and you know everything else i always have my to-do lists but i have to hit these you know kind of critical things to move the ball forward Mm, awesome. Yeah, we had a mention pre-call as far as kind of like uh, some of the format and stuff, but I always love to ask my, my guests when they come on a show. You got, you mentioned a lot about family and faith and stuff, but is there anything else that you're, you're grateful for? Yeah, I'm grateful for, I mean, outside of family and faith, obviously, which are the top two, you know, I, uh, I'm just super grateful for the mentors that have shown us kind of what's possible. Um, I think we pigeonhole our thought process a lot by thinking that we're alone on an island and we have to figure this all out. You know, we're not curing cancer here. We're just buying real estate. We're not the first guys to do it. So our mentors that have really shown us the way and kind of you know, gotten us uh, to that next level, you know, just super grateful for those guys because what that does for my faith and for my family, you know, it, ex it gives me exponential time to, to spend over there because of our mentors showing us that, Hey, we're not reinventing the wheel. This is what you can do to really change your life and to create financial freedom in it. And, you know, if I, when I started my wholesale business 10 years ago, if you would have told me that I bought nearly a hundred million dollars in commercial real estate in 12 months, I just wouldn't have believed you, but we're, we're on track and we're doing it. So we're grateful to uh, basically those that came before us. Awesome. Very well said. And uh, Alex yeah, says, great speak with you and learn more about your business. How do we get in contact with you? So the name of the company is Integrity Holdings Group. So you can just throw that into Google. You'll find us all over the place. The website is integrityhg.com. And we have a free from Wall Street podcast is the name of the podcast. So you can listen to us there. You can find us on YouTube. But yeah, we look forward to hearing from anybody. If we can add value to your life, we'd love to. Awesome. Yeah, Stephen, it was uh, excellent learning more about your business, learning more about you. It was great talking to you. And I look forward to connect with you again soon in the future. Thanks, Enjoy sir. the rest of your week and we'll be uh, talking soon again. All right. Take care. Thank take you. care. Thanks for joining us on this episode of the Wealth Through Real Estate Investing Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review on iTunes or the listening platform of your choice. Also, please check us out at DwayneLClark.com as well as find us on Facebook for more useful content and resources.